A typical childhood Sunday morning. That was the prompt my social work professor instructed the class to imagine. Though one loop. So unusual, I was getting used to the program adopting the Big Brother theme of expect the unexpected, so I played along. As we sat close-eyed in the classroom, my brain wrestled with the word typical. My childhood had seen several addresses and family structures that varied depending on the weekend assigned. So I chose to settle on the nostalgia that didn't hurt. That meant 6105 Benson. That address belongs, forever as far as I'm concerned, to Jerry and Lois Spikes, my grandfather and grandmother. As family lore goes, my grandfather specifically bought this home for my grandma. It was his goal to make sure his wife always had a house to call her own. After financial issues caused them to leave their prior residence in Emerald Hills, Jerry resolved to make sure that never happened again. This all happened when I was itty bitty and I barely remember the first house. My Sunday mornings and elementary school smiles will forever be tied to 6105 Benson, a symbol of determination and love. This space was a sacred reminder that magic was real. The shell itself didn't attract much attention. Driveway lined by imperfect brick, a Christmas star that permanently graced the stucco next to the upstairs bedroom, a modest backyard that consisted mostly of dirt and slope. The beige two-story residence was nestled between a large Baptist church and a middle school dirt field, punctuated by a white screen door, perfect for looking out, but difficult to see into. On most days, there would be a large burgundy construction truck adorned with a large white D out front a landmark that would let all who were looking for the Spice Clan know that they were at the right place. A formerly gray dashboard would be covered in photographs of Grandpa's guiding value, family. This home was just more. Sharing the role of library, museum, theater, gourmet restaurant, bed and breakfast, etc. it was just so much more. But there was one thing my mother made clear Grandma's house was not. In an unceremonious call and response, she had a way of making her question a statement. She would somehow calmly bellow in a frequency that cut through shenanigans that had gotten out of hand with, Grandma's house is not a what? My cousins and I knew that that was both the first and final warning. We would reply in unison, it's not a playground, and modify our play, which usually meant taking it elsewhere. There are plenty of other ways to be entertained in that house. During holidays, my older cousin Leanne and I would grab notepads and pens from junk drawers in the kitchen and pretend to be waitresses for adults who were too stuffed to move, but not too full to turn down seconds. We would carry around red solo cups and solicit tips. Family friends would be amused by the little girls they watched mature from drooling toddlers to entrepreneurial spirits, and they would oblige us with pocket change. No gathering was complete without music. My cool young auntie Lynn would help us come up with spontaneous choreography to songs that I did not fully understand until much later. Aretha Franklin would come on, and there would be a chorus of little black girls from the 90s that you would have sworn grew up in the era of 45s with the intensity of how we belted out, chain, chain, chain. And then there was the storytelling. Parties big and small would often culminate with sprawled bodies in the living room attempting to outdo each other and the retelling of events in our family history. Sometimes I would snuggle under my grandma's feet and yell, tell me what my mom was like when she was my age, just to shake things up and see my aunts compete over the most over-the-top thing that Renee had done. To this day, my perfect night consists of cackling and comfort. Vincent taught me that you don't need much to have an amazing time if the vibe is right. Sometimes, I would imagine myself a historian. I would flip through encyclopedias of black history my grandmother collected, my elementary school attention span mostly focused on the pictures absorbing the stark differences between black and white realities and the one that I knew. Around the kitchen table, I'd have conversations with my mother about racism, why people could be so nasty. I would speak about plans to change the whole world while my grandmother cackled and smiled. My grandmother was a master in subtle communication, a skill enhanced by the sudden stroke she had when I was three. Her words might not have been loud, but they echoed for me. Receiving a quiet laugh from her meant more than a room full of applause. A smile from her let me know I was on the right track. Growing up, I did not know the distinction of neighborhoods and what they meant to the outside world. I knew that in San Diego, there was a home base that family near and far clung to, and that meant going up the big hill and to the left. This landmark was in close proximity to the world-famous Barrel, Johnson Elementary, the school that educated two generations of Jerry's babies, and the Boys and Girls Club where I spent summers. This place has been host to so many good memories, so many beautiful Sunday mornings with coffee and comics, naps on the carpet, laughter. This is the childhood that I've chosen to center. Like I said, I'm not sure when exactly I learned that the area surrounding my haven had a name. I'm also not sure when I realized that that name ranks synonymous with inferior for some. I just know that at some point my rose-colored glasses shifted tint as my magic play slipped from my hands. By the time I graduated high school, everything had changed. 
Grandpa had passed, aunties and cousins had moved across the country, and we no longer had huge family get-togethers that commanded comfort and joy. When my aunt managed to buy a beautiful new house in a development across town, she moved and took my grandmother with her, renting out our home to strangers. Around the same time, I decided that San Diego didn't really need to be home for me anymore. I went off to college in Virginia and resolved to only come back for visits. Tell God your plans, and he laughs. There was a hearty chuckle in the heavens as I ended up back in Southeast San Diego post-graduation. If I was on the Real Housewives franchise from 2012 to 2015, my catchphrase would have been, don't get used to this face because as soon as I can escape to a metropolitan area with culture and black people, I'm out. Bloop. So, I would say shocked is an understatement when friends and family who knew the anti-San Diego me asked my plans for the future, and they would include Southeast San Diego. Somewhere in between fighting my hometown because nothing about my childhood was the same and doing what came naturally, I realized that the important parts were still with me. The desire to create safe space for people to be themselves, to love and laugh, to change the world, they were all still here. On May 14, 2016, I was working for a program that brought all of these ideals together, encouraging young people to be their best selves and tell their truth through art. I was also face to face for the first time in almost a decade with my more. I was tasked with working a street care across the street from 6105. I was overwhelmed with several unpretty emotions like dread, resentment, anger, and guilt. I'd be lying if I say that for the majority of the time I sit across the street in eyesight of that brick and beige stucco that I had a cheery demeanor. It took me a while, as grand lessons usually do, to realize the full circle beauty of being back where I felt the most love, the genesis of my more. My Sunday morning peace prepared me for where I was always supposed to be, and I'm okay with being back here. Thank you.